So as I've said multiple times on this channel recently, Kyle Kalinske is becoming one of my absolute favorite people to make video responses to. And the reason for that, as I've said a bunch of times, is because the left is under the misimpression that Kyle Kalinske is some kind of intellectual, some kind of deep thinker or policy wonk, when in reality, all of his arguments are rudimentary, they're filled with fallacies, and they're the easiest things in the world to refute, dispute, and outright debunk. And that's what we're going to do today, because Kyle Kalinske put out a video about a CNBC segment talking about people becoming billionaires. And he's really mad at this segment because there are people who are poor, and according to Kyle, somebody having more money than you is the cause of you having less money. But before we get into that, I just want to say Merry Christmas and thank you very much to my patrons, subscribe store subscribers, one-time donors, and the people who support me via the join button, even though YouTube jacks 30%, and I would prefer the joiners join up on Patreon, Subscribestore, or any other thing except for that. Because recently, YouTube has been doing some weird things with my channel, and I don't think it's directly directed at me, it's not a conspiracy or anything like that, but to give you an example of what I'm talking about, I recently resubmitted for second manual review, one of my videos that I actually ended up making a second cut of and ended up getting monetized because I thought the reason that they gave for why this was demonetized made absolutely no sense. And the response I got from YouTube was outrageous. They sent me an email saying that the reason that they demonetized the video, the reason a second person reviewing it also came to the conclusion that it cannot run ads on it is due to the fact that I had excessive tobacco promotion. You've seen this video. There is no tobacco promotion in it at all whatsoever. And when I replied to this email, they told me in a very, not very nice corporate way to piss off because they had already made their decision. They said that there was tobacco at 826 and therefore it is so. So yes, thank you again to all the people who support this channel and thank you to all of you who watch this channel, like the videos and share the videos. I really appreciate it. It's what gets me through these hilariously weird responses from YouTube the company. Now that we got all that sentimental stuff out of the way and you guys have seen my heart, let's get into this video and we're going to start with the CNBC segment that Kyle Kalinske showed because I think it's important that we take note of the two companies that recently went public and the billionaires that this produced. I'm celebrating, Robert. I'm not one of them, but I'm just on the record. I'm not Bernie Sanders. I'm, I'm celebrating, I'm celebrating that there's taxes, there's philanthropy, there's the possibility it can happen to other people if you work hard and have a great idea. I like millionaires and I like billionaires, but uh, you go ahead. I'm not going to comment on this. I have, I have no editorial opinion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah th these stories are just really inspirational, no matter what your point of view. You've got this week two IPOs, six billionaires, over $40 billion in personal wealth. You look at DoorDash, they minted three new multi-billionaires this week. CEO Tony Hsu, he's now worth over $2.7 billion. You've got co-founders Andy Fang and Stanley Tang. They were all friends at Stanford, and they did the first coding and food delivering while working at night while they were students at school. Those two guys worth $2.5 billion. Now, the winner of the week was Brian Chesky. He, of course, Airbnb CEO. He's one of three co-founders who started the company when they were flat broke, sitting in a San Francisco apartment, they decided to rent out air mattresses to make the rent. Chesky, now worth over $11 billion. So the companies are Airbnb and DoorDash, two companies that were started by small groups of people in their garages when they didn't have a lot of money that recently netted the founders of those companies billions of dollars. It's a great story, and I understand why CNBC, a financial channel, is deciding to cover it. And since they're not Bernie Sanders types or Kyle Kalinske types that believe in the fixed pie fallacy, I understand why they're covering it in an optimistic way. But let's see how Kyle Kalinske responds to this story. This is just a perfect CNBC clip. It's everything that's terrible about CNBC in one clip. So the main problem here is they clearly believe in the myth of meritocracy. That's how they're talking. They're talking like, who, me? I'm not like Bernie Sanders. I don't want to punish success. I want to reward success. 
I think this is wonderful that we have more millionaires and more billionaires now. Yes, unsurprisingly, people on a channel that covers financial news are making the distinction between themselves and an idiot named Bernie Sanders who doesn't understand anything about finance and the economy. Bernie is a self-described socialist and you cannot arrive at that position and hold on to it late into your almost 80s without being a not very smart person who doesn't understand how anything works. Who, me? I'm not like Bernie Sanders. I don't want to punish success. I want to reward success. I think this is wonderful that we have more millionaires and more billionaires now. Also, great voice. Really, really nailing it, Kyle Kalinske, with the analysis, doing a smug person voice and going like this with your uh, suit jacket. Fantastic, absolutely impressive. Really sells the point that rich, out-of-touch people are evil and bad while you're a man of the people. The idea that the reason why these people are getting wealthy is because they just worked harder than everybody else. That's provably not true. That's clearly not the case. I've said this before, but some of the hardest working people I've ever known were working like two or three low wage jobs. All of their waking moments were spent working and they still never made enough money to have a decent, comfortable life. So the idea of the harder you work, the further you go, that's not accurate. So of course, this is a ridiculous argument. It's rudimentary analysis of the value of labor and work, but Kyle Kalinske puts it forward and people just gobble it up. Yes, you can define hard work as physically grueling labor. And you can talk about how people who do physically grueling labor don't actually end up making that much money. Because again, just because something is physically grueling does not necessarily mean that that labor is valuable or in demand enough in the economy. What's actually important here is how productive the work is. Because remember, economics is all about the allocation of scarce resources that have alternative uses. And if you are better at allocating resources, than the people you're competing with, then you will reap the benefits of that success. When we had a more labor-driven market, when we needed more physically demanding jobs, when that was the bulk of the economy, people who worked in those occupations made a lot more money in comparison to what those jobs, those low skill jobs would make today. But now we have a completely different economy. Most of those dangerous, super labor intensive jobs are now either supplemented or completely done by machines. And we have a much higher standard of living for it. And people are way less likely to die during their job than they used to be in the past as well. And like, I would be sympathetic to people if they defend the hierarchy of a meritocracy, if it's an actual meritocracy. But we don't have a meritocracy, so stop pretending like we do. I'm so tired of playing these games with these people. If it's not a meritocracy, then you can't really celebrate people getting rich. Well, we do have a meritocracy. The people who succeed in this country succeed because they are better at allocating scarce resources with alternative uses in our economy, and they reap the benefits of that innovation. Again, the companies here are Airbnb and DoorDash. Who did they steal from? These people were not people who inherited all this money. Again, they started these companies in their garage or when they all didn't have jobs. And in the beginning, they were doing the driving or the work with those jobs. So what the hell are you talking about? It's not a meritocracy. Who did they rob in order to become rich? What people were exploited by these evil corporations? And then the other thing is they sincerely believe, oh, you know, somebody's wealth doesn't make anybody else poor. But that's not really true either. The idea that like, oh, just because this person's got like $10 billion doesn't mean that this person who's living on less than minimum wage is impacted by this person having $10 billion. And it's like, of course. There's a finite amount of money and wealth. There's a finite amount of money and wealth. There's a finite amount of money and wealth in this country. Therefore, the person with $10 billion is impacting the person on minimum wage in that they are negatively impacted by somebody else having $10 billion. This is unbelievably stupid and ridiculous. And by the way, even Kyle Kalinske on a certain level knows that this makes no sense. The idea that there's a finite amount of wealth when wealth is being created, that's how you become wealthy, by the way. That's what these companies do. They're generating new wealth. They're not taking something from somebody else is ridiculous. I mean, do you think that there is more wealth today than when we were back in the hunter-gatherer times in prehistoric times? 
Or do you think that we're just redistributing the same amount of wealth? Of course you don't believe that because you'd have to be an absolute imbecile to believe that. But what about the billionaire's point? Because some people will say, sure, Sean, that is true. Wealth is created to a certain extent, but at a certain point, we're just shuffling the wealth around and wealth stops being created for some arbitrary imaginary reason. And now that people are getting billions of dollars, therefore they must be taking it from the poor. Well, the first official billionaire in the world was a Rockefeller in 1916. Do you believe that the standard of living in the United States of America was higher in 1916 when we just had one billionaire as compared to 2020 when we have hundreds, I don't know, maybe even thousands of billionaires worldwide? You can't believe that. If you do believe that, you're an absolute buffoon. Now, while I'd love to keep telling you why Kyle Kalinske is wrong, I think it's very important to highlight an instance where he is correct in this video. So the idea of like that person's $10 billion has no reflection on the fact that this person's a working poor person. I mean, honestly, it's stupid if, if you believe that. So this part is actually true. The person who makes minimum wage is in fact impacted by somebody else being able to make $10 billion. Of course, Kyle's wrong about this being a negative relationship. In fact, it is a positive relationship. And I'm going to use the two companies, Airbnb and DoorDash, in order to prove this point. What do these two companies do? And we'll start with Airbnb. This company connects people who want to rent out their properties for short-term rentals, mostly to tourists, with people who want to rent property from people while they're on vacation, mostly. Now, stupid people who probably click on this video because they're fans of Kyle Kalinske are already firing away in the comments telling me about how the people who are renting out their properties and the tourists who want to stay at them would be able to connect on their own without this middleman just skimming profit off the top and putting it in their Scrooge McDuck vault because they're evil billionaires who want to hurt the poor. And yes, this is actually true. You could not use Airbnb in order to either rent your property or rent a property from a person. You could use Craigslist. But if you use Craigslist, then you just have to hope an add-on Craigslist is as legitimate as an add-on Airbnb. You can't look at the reviews of the property from other users to get an assessment about what they think about the property. And there's no insurance or protections for your transaction like you would get through Airbnb. So what Airbnb actually does is securitize these transactions between people who want to stay at properties and people who want to rent out their properties. That's where they make all their money. They took something that did exist without them monitoring the system and they basically added market regulations and verification to the process. Now, I'm not saying that the Airbnb system is perfect. There are horror stories for sure, but would there be more horror stories if the same amount of users were using something unverified like Craigslist versus Airbnb? or would there be less? More importantly, would less people be willing to rent rooms in this manner without Airbnb being there? And the answer is clearly and obviously no. And I can tell you that from personal experience. When I decided that I was gonna go on a trip to Spain with my girlfriend, one of the places that we stayed when we were in the city of Barcelona was an Airbnb. Now, if not for Airbnb, there would be no way that I would have paid money to somebody in a foreign country to stay at a property that may or may not be there when I arrive in the city because I need more verification during my planning of a trip than can be offered by a Craigslist ad in a language that I don't even speak. But Airbnb handled this process, and more importantly, they handled this process for $150 less a night than I would have been charged had I stayed in a hotel in the city of Barcelona instead. And by the way, it's not just me, the person who's renting a private residence in a foreign country where I don't speak the language, who felt protected to a satisfactory amount by Airbnb system. The person renting the property also doesn't know the people that are coming in, but they can also be rated by Airbnb and vetted by Airbnb, and they even offer insurance due to certain things that could go wrong when renting your property to a private party. Now, Airbnb didn't rob me. They didn't make me worse off. They didn't make me poorer. They actually ended up saving me $150 a night, plus the cost of transportation because the hotels that I could afford in the city of Barcelona were way further from the locations that I actually wanted to go compared to this Airbnb. And they didn't rob the host because there is a 0% chance I would have rented this private residence from my home in New York City 
from a person that didn't speak the language if I saw the ad on Craigslist. Everyone was better off from the transaction because again, all Airbnb did was figure out a way to allocate scarce resources with alternative uses in a more efficient way than previously existed before this company came into existence. They created the wealth that led to the wealth of the founders of the company. And the same is true for DoorDash. What DoorDash does is connect people who want food with restaurants that don't do delivery and drivers who are willing to make that delivery. Now, while I love to make fun of all these food delivery services as much as the next guy, because sometimes it seems ridiculous when you just look at the receipt with no context, the fees that they're charging, but in reality, that fee service sometimes is definitely worth it, and you wouldn't be able to get delivery from this many restaurants if not for that fee covering the cost of doing business. Now, a perfect example of this is when I used to work in Manhattan and I would want to get food from this place that has the absolute best Japanese rice of all time. Now, I know what you're thinking, Sean, how good can a rice dish possibly be? And what I can say is better than what you're imagining times 100. That's how fantastic this place was. But the problem with this was that it was actually 20 minutes away. 20 minutes by public transit, 20 minutes by cab, and 30 minutes by walk. And I only had a half hour lunch break. So there was no way I could spend 40 minutes on transportation in order to get this food. Also, I was making about $25 an hour when I was working at this place. And they had no delivery service. Well, actually, they had no delivery service until the existence of Uber Eats, DoorDash, and I forgot what that other company that does the same exact thing is called, but that one too. Now, with 30 minutes to walk to this place, 30 minutes to walk back, assuming I'm eating on the way, I'm adding in no extra time for me to actually eat the meal, which in reality would take like 10 to 20 minutes, I would be losing a full hour of work, AKA $25, in order to get the lunch that I wanted to eat while I'm at work. Now, these services, I can actually order the food in advance and somebody else can take care of the transportation time and as long as the delivery fee that I pay for this service is under $25, then I've actually profited off this transaction because they're saving me time and as we all know, time is money. So again, who is being robbed in this scenario? Me who pays the $5 delivery fee and is still up a net $20 in comparison to what I would have lost had I actually made the trip myself? The driver who would not be able to get a job as a driver because a bunch of these restaurants can't afford their own individual drivers? Or the restaurant who actually gains a customer that they would not normally be able to maintain because they don't offer delivery service? The answer is none of the above. All three parties are winners based on the service that DoorDash has created. So the idea of like that person's $10 billion has no reflection on the fact that this person's a working poor person. I mean, honestly, it's stupid if, if you believe that. I think the people who believe that are like disregarding all evidence. Wow, you cannot present the fixed pie fallacy and call other people stupid. You can't say all the evidence is on your side when literally none of the evidence is on your side. All the evidence we have from the examples that I just gave, from the one billionaire in 1916 to 2020, however many billionaires we have now, and the standard of living difference between 2020 and 1916, says that wealth is created, not just shuffled around. You're the one who's wrong about all of this. An estimated 41.4% of the total U.S. population, 135 million people, are either poor or low income. CEO compensation has grown 940% since 1978, and your typical worker, their pay has only risen 12% during that time. Of course, Kyle starts vomiting up the stupid standard talking points about how these small number of people have this much money compared to this 50% giant chunk of the population that has this much money as if the bottom 50% or whatever percentage is not improving and that the top whatever amount of people are taking the money from those poor people. These people always talk about the golden era of America. When union work, you could just go turn a wrench for 40 hours a week and come home, have a house and a car and blah, blah, blah. And it was a magical time in America when none of these people, absolutely none of them, would accept the standard of living of the 50s and 60s. Lyndon Baines Johnson, a big part of his presidential platform, was giving 
power to the huge portion of Americans that didn't have electricity at this time that's supposedly the golden era. Remember that when people like Kyle Kalinske tell you about how the wealth distribution chart in the 50s and 60s looks so much better than how it looks today, that that was a significant portion of Lyndon Baines Johnson's presidential platform. Remember that they're glorifying a time where a significant portion of the American population didn't have refrigeration, they didn't have air conditioning, they didn't have a television set, a phone looked like this when they're talking about how those were the good old days in the United States of America when everything was fairer. Nobody wants to live like that today. It's just nonsense to assert that this is the golden period of America. Everything we have right now is better. There's a, a, a disconnect between productivity and wages. People have been incredibly productive for decades and their wages have barely budged. So we already went over this nonsense about wages and productivity separating when I talked in this video about how capital investments in technology are what are driving up productivity as compared to the worker being more productive. But it's also important to point out that the charts that are often presented in order to prove this point conspicuously leave out health insurance benefits that are paid to the employee via the employer as forms of compensation in order to get a more dramatic difference. Also, these charts tend to way overstate inflation. A lot of times you'll look at the bottom of it and what they're actually using is the urban price index instead of the standard consumer price index. Obviously, things are more expensive in urban areas than in rural areas. And since we have a country that is a combination of urban and rural, it's not really sensible to use the prices of just urban areas unless you're trying to inflate the cost a little bit more and show more inflation in order to drive an agenda. Also on top of that, products don't make it into the CPI until they become widely used and available, which means the price has fallen significantly on those products. And the categories are arbitrary and they don't take into account how much about the products that we arbitrarily call the same have changed over time. For instance, this is a cell phone from the early 90s, and this is a cell phone from the 2020s. These are completely different products in a million different ways, yet we're comparing the price of this to this over time. Even if this modern mobile phone sold for $100 more, that wouldn't actually indicate that the price of mobile phones was rising. In fact, it would indicate the opposite because there's so much more technology and components to this phone compared to that phone. It's just completely arbitrary that we categorize them in the same thing when they are completely different. And if you don't believe me, then I have a very special challenge for you. And I won't say go and use this phone. Go use this iPhone, the original iPhone 3G, the one that actually has internet, and tell me how functional and practical this product is and how there's virtually no difference from the later generation of iPhones. I'll wait. And while you're at it, why don't you go to the Salvation Army and pick yourself up an old tube TV? Because according to the Consumer Price Index, this and this are TVs and they are comparable in every way and a good test to measure inflation. We don't live in a meritocracy. So you bring up these rags to riches story. That's not like the way the system works. Those people are lucky. If they're honest, they'll tell you they're lucky. And just so you know, up to 45% of wealth is inherited rather than self-made. Think about that. Now, Kyle goes on to cry about inheritance. He greatly overestimates it. Studies have repeatedly shown that of the millionaires in this country, only 23% of them had any inheritance at all whatsoever. And an even smaller percentage of that 23% actually inherited over $100,000, and the smallest percentage of millionaires inherited the bulk of their current amount of money from their parents. So complete nonsense that Kyle is spewing here, just general Marxist nonsense talk. And by the way, even if people were inheriting a larger share of money, there's nothing wrong with that. People work hard in order to secure a future for their children. The idea that Kyle Kalinske should be able to rally a mob of people to rob your kids after you die is in no way, shape, or form moral. But hey, those are just my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you like this video, then please show me by leaving a like. You can subscribe for more content. Follow me on all my social medias. You can support me via the support links in the description box. This has been me making fun of Kyle Kalinske, crying about billionaires and talking about the fixed pie fallacy. Till next time.